guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is Thursday at nine o'clock. It's time for a Magic Live. Now today, I'm going to be talking to you about something that is vitally important. In fact, I'm going to talk to you about probably the most important thing that you can do as a magician in order to guarantee that your performance is good. This is something that every magician should do. A lot of magicians don't do. And if you do it, it's going to make sure that you never screw up a trick in front of an audience. That's right. Doing this exercise that I'm going to go through with you right now will make sure that you will never screw up a trick in front of a live audience, or at least it's very, very unlikely. So now that I've teased what this video is all about, let's get into it and I'll explain exactly what we're going to be doing. So how are you going to make sure that you never screw up a trick? Well, the most important thing that you can do and the thing that so many magicians don't do is to prepare and create outs that will effectively make sure that whatever situation you find yourself in, you can get out of it immediately. Now, that sounds very, very simple, but there's a lot to that statement. So let me, let me break it down for you a little bit. First of all, the thing that you understand, the, thing that you, the first thing that you need to understand is why mistakes are made in a live performance environment. Because the thing is, magicians will always make mistakes. Magicians will always make mistakes. That's what happens when you're performing live and you're effectively trying to deceive the people that you're performing for. Mistakes will happen. Now, a lot of the time, these are going to be completely out of your control. Uh, it, it might just happen. Like, I've had things happen to me in my career while I've been performing, and you never could have imagined that that was going to happen. I remember once performing on a stage, and the scaffolding fell down and literally broke an illusion into bits. I remember another time in another illusion show where we didn't realise um, that uh, there was a slope on the stage, and literally came out, started the illusion show, and watched as the box literally fell off the stage and again smashed into a million pieces. There's certain stuff that it's unlikely will ever happen. There's other things that will happen that will be your fault. Maybe you've lost the card. Maybe you were doing a card trick and you lost the pinky break or whatever it may be, and you've completely lost the card and you have no idea where it is in the deck right now. Whatever the reason, there's a million different things that can go wrong. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's not your fault. However, what is under your control is the ability to deal with it effectively. Because that is what this video is all about. How to make sure that when a mistake happens, the audience is completely unaware that a mistake has even taken place. And that's going to be through the effective use of outs and through preparation. Okay, through outs and through preparation. Now, you know, when I was uh, in sales many, many, many years ago, I remember Chris Mandrakis, who taught me how to do sales. Uh, he turned around to me and he said, uh, proper preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. And he was talking about it from a sales point of view. And he was saying, hey, if you're going out and you're, you're selling and you're knocking on people's doors, you want to make sure that you're, you're prepared for every single eventuality. But he was right. You know, as a salesperson, I became a very, very good salesperson. And one of the reasons I was such a good salesperson is because I was prepared for everything that somebody would say to me. If somebody said something to me, I had an answer immediately. Nothing stumped me. Uh, and that's the same basic concept that we're going to be talking about here. Being prepared. Now, when I talk about being prepared, I'm not talking about practicing. I'm not talking about, hey, you've got to make sure that you practice your double lift a million times to make sure it's correct. I'm talking about being prepared for the performance in front of you. And the best way that you can do that is through the effective use of outs. Now, when I'm talking about outs, I'm not talking about the way that we traditionally use outs in the context of a, of a, of a magic trick. So, for example, you know, the, the standard way of using an out is having three envelopes, um, having or having three items, having somebody pick an item, and there's an out for each one. So I might have a prediction in my pocket, a prediction printed on one of the uh, objects, and a pred uh, whatever it may be. That's how outs are used in magic. I'm sure that every single person watching this has 
a routine or two or three or four routines that they use in their act that requires outs. That is not what I'm talking about right now. What I'm talking about right now is analyzing every single trick you do, analyzing every single set that you do, breaking it down step by step and working out where things can go wrong and then coming up with a solution for those problems. Now, let me explain why that's important. It's important because when you are stressed, you will never make good decisions. I'm going to say that again so it sinks in. When you are stressed, you are never going to make effective decisions. Now, a friend of mine whose uh, name is Cros Crosley, he's a business mentor. He calls himself the mindset technician. He applies this to business and he talks about how business owners should never make decisions when they're stressed because when you're stressed, you rush the decision and it's normally not the decision that you want to make. Um, and that's true. And it's the same within performance. You're never going to make a good decision when you're stressed. So when you are in a situation where you're performing, whether it be to three or four people in the close up environment or five or six thousand people on stage, if you have screwed up a trick and you don't know what you're going to do, you are under an intense amount of stress. The client will be there watching you. And you're probably thinking of a million things at once. We've all been there, right? Where something has completely gone wrong and you're trying to work out what to do about it. And it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? And you kind of race through the different options are in front of you whilst all the time thinking that the audience are going to hate you. Uh, this is going terribly wrong. What am I going to do about this? Oh my God, the client's never going to book me again. I've screwed my career up. Whatever it may be, you're never going to make a great decision when you're stressed. So how do we reduce the stress out of the situation? How do we effectively make the decision without being stressed because I'm always going to be stressed if something goes wrong mid-performance. The answer is to make the decision before it happens and that's what I mean by outs. What I mean is you have to break down every single trick that you do and you have to work out every single way that that trick can go wrong. And then you need to work out what you're going to do in that scenario. Because if you're performing a routine and a trick goes wrong or a particular sequence goes wrong and you haven't considered any of this, you've then got to jazz it. Now, some magicians are amazing at jazzing. Some magicians aren't that amazing, but some magicians are amazing at jazzing and they might be able to get themselves out of that situation. But why even put yourself under that pressure? Why not? analyze the trick beforehand, work out how it could possibly go wrong, and then come up with a solution to that problem beforehand. Because we all know this, but the, generally as a rule, the audience that are watching your routines and your performances, they don't know what you're going to do before you do it. Unless you specifically tell them at the beginning of the routine, unless you specifically say, right, in this trick, I'm going to have you sign a card. It's going to come to the deck. It's going to, it's going to get lost in the deck and it's going to come to the top of the deck. I'm then going to do that another four times and then eventually it will end in my wallet. Unless you do that and you literally break down how the trick's going to go, you have the freedom of being able to go in a different direction. So, for example, let's say you were doing a trick where you were supposed to have the card control to the top. You do a double lift. It's not their card. And then, boom, it changes into their card. And the card's not on the top when you do the double turnover. It's not worked. So you've done the double turnover. You think you've controlled the card. You've done the double turnover. You've shown in a different card. You took it off. You've snapped and you've changed it. And it's not their card. Well, you know, now you're in a situation where you have to go in a different direction, right? You no longer can go and claim that that was the trick. Oh my God, the card changed. It's a miracle. Thank you very much. Because that's not their signed card. So you're going to have to go in the other direction. But because you didn't tell the audience that you were going to do that, I'm going to take an indifferent card and change it into your card. You can go in a different direction, do a completely different trick. And that's absolutely fine. And as I say, there's certain people that relish this situation and they can they can jazz it and they can go in a completely different million different ways and they can fix it. But there's other people that can't. And so by analysing how these tricks would work and how they're going to go wrong, it removes the stress from the situation. So um, let's take that as an example, right? So let's take that very simple trick as an example. So the trick is a card is picked, it is signed, it is lost in the pack, you do a double turnover, you show an indifferent card, and then the card comes to the top of the pack. Uh, sorry, and then the card changes into their selected card. 
here's the process that you should go through. And this is very, very useful if you're new to magic. This is very, very useful if you're new to paid gigs. And what I mean by that is you might have been in magic for years, but now you're taking the leap to go and perform professionally. When you perform for professionally for money, suddenly it becomes a little bit more real, right? Suddenly it becomes a little bit more real. So with that in, with that in mind, it is a very useful exercise to do whether you've been in magic for a year or 50 years or 20 years or whatever. So let's take that routine as an example, okay? Very simple routine there. Let's take it as an example. What I would want you to do right now is take each one of your routines and take a blank piece of paper. And at the top of the blank piece of paper, I want you to write the name of the routine. So we'll call this the double lift card trick. I don't know. So we'll call it double lift card trick. So at the top, you write double lift card trick. Then you write a very brief one sentence description of what happens in the trick. The card comes, uh, an indifferent card changes into the selected card. Brilliant. So now we're going to look at all of the different ways that this trick can go wrong and write them down. So you're going to write down on the one side of the piece of paper all the different ways that the trick can go wrong. So let's just, um, to do this, you have to kind of go through the trick. So let's go through the trick. Well, the first thing that happens is somebody picks a card. Is there anything that can go wrong there? Well, it depends on how anal you want to get about this. And what I mean is, what happens if somebody bumps into you and you drop the cards on the floor? Well, you know, if that happens to you in a gigging situation and all the cards have dropped all over the floor, that can be a very cringy moment where it's kind of like, oh, um, let me just go and pick those up. That's very unprofessional. So you might want to take it right to its bare bones, right to the nth degree and just get ridiculous over this. So number one, I could drop the cards while I'm performing. In, in business, by the way, they call this a risk assessment, uh, which is basically uh, writing down all of the risks and then writing down the solution to the risks. Uh, a lot of the time when you're booked as a professional magician, you'll get asked for a risk assessment, especially if you're doing like an illusion act. What are the risks? Well, we're going to be using pyro. What's the risk? Well, this can happen. What's the solution? Well, the solution is this, right? So this is basically all we're doing is we're taking a risk assessment and we're applying it to the methodology of the tricks that we're actually performing. So back to it. You could drop the cards over the floor. So, um, what you know, it, it, that would look terrible, right? So what's the solution? Well, the solution is have a spare pack of cards. And I bring this up because that happened to me. I remember one of the very first close-up gigs that I did, I dropped the cards all over the floor and it was at a table at a restaurant and some of the cards had gone under the table and some cards had gone under somebody else's table and I didn't have another pack of cards and I was on my hands and knees searching for playing cards and it was really embarrassing. The management of the restaurant wasn't happy. Waiters couldn't get past me. I, was, I looked terrible to all of the customers that were in the restaurant that were watching me. My suit got filthy because so I was on my hands and my knees. It's not a great situation. So have another deck of cards with you. So you go, well, that's not a problem because, hey, I, I'm a professional. I always carry a spare pack of cards. You could even write down a joke to use at that point. And, you know, gravity, not just a good idea. It's the law or whatever joke that you want to apply in this situation. Having a second deck of cards to pull out saves you because then you've sacrificed those cards. Not a problem. You can pick them up at the end of the night or you can say to the staff, I've dropped some cards. Don't worry about it. I'm going to push them out of the way. We'll get rid of them at the end of the night or whatever it may be. But that that's an example of something that you might not even consider as an issue. But when it happens to you for the first time, oh, it can be so embarrassing. But then you get past that. So they pick a card, right? OK, brilliant. So they pick a card. What's the next thing that happens? They're going to sign the card, right? OK, so here you could put down well, what happens if they sign the back of the card. And we've all been there, right? When when the card gets signed on the back and it's kind of like, oh, how do you deal with that? Because that is an issue that affects the trick, because now you can't do that trick because you can't control the card because they'll know that the cards come to the top because there's signatures on the back of it. So how do you deal with that situation? Well, how do you deal with that situation? There's a few ways that you can deal with it. First of all, you can take the card and you can go, huh, you can make a joke out of it and go, huh, you ever helped a magician? You're not helping one now. Don't worry, take another card, blah, 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 blah. Or you could go, huh, you know, never work with animals, children, or Alan, it seems. Thanks very much for Alan. You know, to you, this is a joke. To me, it's a career. Whatever it may be, you could blow it off as a joke and just get them to sign another card. Or you can think of a routine that uses a card with a signature on the back. Chris Congreve actually has a couple of those in his latest book, which I have over here, actually, Curious and Curiouser. In this book, he actually has a couple of routines that are designed to be done specifically when a spectator signs the back of the card instead of the face of the card, which is really smart. 
because then you've got a routine that you can go into. And this comes back to what I said earlier on, which is the audience don't know which way you're going. So if you openly say, I'm gonna show you a trick, it's gonna be amazing. And then you have to go in a different direction, which we are doing in this situation. Well, it's not a problem if we haven't told them what's gonna happen at the beginning, right? So, but that's the second thing. So now you've got another risk, what could happen? They could sign the back of the card. Why would this be an issue? Well, it would screw the trick up. What's the solution? Well, I can either do this, I can either go in a different direction and do a different trick, or I can just throw the card away and just blow it off as a joke. Perfect. So what's the next? The next thing is um, uh, the card gets put back into the pack and you control it to the top. Well, here there's a few things that can go wrong. So first of all, you could have uh, a situation where you've lost control of the card, or you could have a situation where um, you, the spectator, uh, grabs the cards and goes, oh, let me do that, or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, it could be a situation in various different ways where you've actually lost the card in the deck. Well, if I've actually lost the card in the deck, that's an issue, because now, how are you supposed to continue with the original trick if the card is actually lost in the deck? Well, you can't. So what are you going to do about that situation? Well, you know, there's a few different things you could do. You could hand the cards out to be shuffled, because it doesn't matter at that point, because obviously... All the cards are, uh, you know, the cards actually mixed up in the deck. And then you can take the cards back and you can go, well, that's, uh, um, that's uh, that, yeah, well, how I would deal with this. I'd say, look, if I snap my fingers, it comes to the top of the pack. Was that your card? Oh, that would have been good. Oh, well, um, that would have been fantastic, wouldn't it? Oh, well, um, what was your card? Seven of diamonds. Hang on, let me go through. And as I go through, I'm going to cull the seven of diamonds. Let me go through. I don't see the seven. Are you sure you picked the seven of diamonds? Are you sure you picked the seven of diamonds? I don't think you could have picked the seven of diamonds because it's not here. It's not in the deck. Now I've called it to the back of the deck. No, it's not here. I definitely, definitely couldn't have picked the seven of diamonds. I think you're, you're wrong. You're definitely wrong. Do you know why? Palm the seven of diamonds off. It's because I keep the seven of diamonds here in my pocket. What's weird is it's the one with your signature. Uh, isn't that weird? And now I've gone in a completely different direction. I've had the card, um, you know, I've just... Oh, I've culled the card, had it come to the top of the pack, palmed the card off, and I've done like a, a very, very simple card in pocket. But that's a necessity because I'd lost control of the card, right? So that's the, the risk is you lose control of the card and you're aware that you've lost the control of the card. What do you do? Well, you can do a cull and a palm and do a card to pocket. Brilliant. But again, it relies on you not telling the audience ahead of time what you're going to do. So what's the next thing that can go wrong? Well, the next thing that can go wrong is... Um, you could, you could, okay, so here we go. So the card, you think that you've controlled the card correctly, right? So you think the card's on top of the deck. You do the double turnover. You show them a different card. You turn it back over. You snap your fingers and the card changes a bit. It doesn't change into their selected card. So in other words, the card, you've lost control of the card again, but you weren't even aware of it. You thought you'd controlled the card correctly, but you hadn't. Uh, what do you do in this situation? Well, it's very tempting to go, well, you'll do the same thing as before. But now you've got a situation where you've got this, uh, you've got this change, right? So you get, this is now something to think of. So when knowing that this is something that could potentially happen, you could build that into the presentation of the tricks rather than just saying, look, I've got the seven of diamonds. Is that your card? No. Well, if I turn it over and I snap my fingers, the card changes. If you say the card changes instead of the card changes into your card, well, now, if it goes wrong and it's not the card, you can go, they, they will say it's not my card. And you can go, well, I never said it was. I just said the card's changed. Look, I'm a magician. I've just changed the card. Come on, what do you want from me, people? Isn't this good enough for you? What, you see this sort of thing every single day? <laughs> what? And they'll laugh and they'll, they'll, they'll get into that and they'll find it very, very funny. And in the action, you can go back and you can control the card to the top of the deck by doing a cull um, and, and then palm the card off. Or you can do the cull and you can go, oh, you wanted me to turn the card into your card. Well, you should have said that. I didn't say I was going to do that. I just said I was going to change the card. If I want to change your card into your card, top change. All I have to do is snap my fingers, blow, and was that your card? Yes, it was. See, is that better for you? Yes. Is that good? Yes, he's clapping now. That's good. So you can see how you can build that situation into it, right? You can go in a different direction depending on whether you're aware that you've lost control of the card or you're not aware that you've lost control of the card. Um, so what's the next issue that can go wrong? So you write that one down. What's the next issue that can go wrong? Well, what happens if you do a double turnover and some smart ass spectator says, oh, you turn two cards over there. What are you going to do in that situation? You tell me what are you going to do if you turn two cards over and someone says, oh, you turn two cards over there. What are you going to do? Because you kind of being called out. And you can't prove that you haven't turned two cards over because you've got two cards on the face of the deck. You have actually turned two cards over. 
So what are you going to do in that situation? Well, there's a few different ways that you could go into it. The first way you could go into it is look at them directly in the eyes and, and get that eye contact, which means they're not looking at the deck, and then just do a KM move. So to take the double off and, and steal back the actual signed card as you flick the card and go, no, it's just, it's just one card. I can't believe you wouldn't trust me. I didn't realise that we had one of these guys in the group. I'm sorry, we learn about you in, in magic books. There's an entire chapter written on you, mate. Look, that is just one card, okay? Um, and then do a top change and then say, that is just one card. Yeah, you hold on to the card yourself. Right, I said I was going to find your card. Uh, do you know where it is? He's holding on to it. Oh my God, freak out. So now you've taken that situation and you've turned it on its head by the use of a KM move. But in normally, if you hadn't thought about that beforehand, that would be the sort of thing that would throw people if you're getting challenged by a spectator. Hey, you've turned two cards over. But what else could you do? What else could you do in that situation? Well, you could do an Erdmaze color change. So you could say, well, there's just one card. There is only one card, but if I rub it, it turns into your card. Ta-da! You can even rub it and turn it into the card and pull this hand away like this, as if it's got a card palmed. And you go, look, it has turned into your card. And if that guy is saying you turn two cards over, they'll probably say it's in that hand. And you go, what? Sorry, what What did you say? And again, it's got you out of that situation. So you could do an Erdnase color change. The other option that you could do is... You could just um, remember that the card's on top of the deck. If they say, hey, you've turned two cards over, you could turn the double back over and say, no, there's just one card. I tell you what, you shuffle the cards. And as you hand the cards over to them, do a one-handed top palm. So now you say you shuffle the cards. That way you know that I'm not cheating. And you've got this card in palm and you can just load that into your wallet or card to wallet or wherever it is that you load cards, you know, card to wallet or pocket or something like that. Or you could just hold it out and add it to the top of the deck. But, you know, that's very simple to do just by turning the double over, handing the deck over to them and doing a one-handed top palm. So there's that way that you could go with it as well, which is another effective way of going in a different direction. But and notice a lot of the time you're not stressed about this. The whole point of writing this list out is you're giving yourself options when you are in the real world and this stuff happens. So as opposed to just stressing because this stuff has happened to you, now you kind of think it, your, your internal monologue rather than going, shit, 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 what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do in the entire world? We've all been there where, so is this room getting hot? Oh, God, my God, I'm sweating. I'm really not. My hands are shaking. Rather than getting that situation, now you're in a situation where you kind of almost just searching your data banks, right? Hang on a minute. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, this, this, okay, I'm going to do a KM move in this situation. So, yeah. Um, and then really, that's really, as far as I can see, the only way is that those tricks can go wrong. But it's a long process, yeah? It's a long process because you want to take every single trick that you deem worthy enough to do in, in a professional gigging situation. So which tricks in your repertoire do you feel you would be happy to go and gig? Because those are the tricks that you need to do this whole exercise with. And if you've got like a repertoire of 100 tricks, you can have 100 pieces of paper, one for each one. And you need to make sure that you know that information. And I cannot tell you how important this is because it will help you I've, I've spoken to so many magicians who, when they first go out and gig, they're stressed. And you'll learn this stuff over time. If you didn't do this exercise, then what will happen is you'll have something horrific happen to you. You'll not know what to deal with it. And you'll think about it afterwards. And you'll go, OK, in that situation, I'd do that. I wish I'd thought of that beforehand. Who's ever been in that situation? Oh, I wish I'd thought of that beforehand. I've seen it loads of times, loads of times. People telling jokes, you know, somebody's uh, said something and then they've thought about it afterwards. Oh, I could have said something back to them. That would have been funny to say. Well, yeah, if you'd thought about it beforehand, it would have been funny. Um, so this process that I'm suggesting you go through, and I know that the people that are watching this video, probably only 50% of you, if that, will do this, will do this exercise. But the ones that do this exercise and the ones that analyze every single trick they do, break it down and, and, and work out what to do, they're just going to be better performers because they're not going to stress. They're going to appear smooth as a cucumber. A cucumber smooth? Smooth as a cucumber? I think that's the same. They're going to appear really, really smooth. They're going to appear really, really relaxed, like nothing phases them. Interestingly, stage magicians tend to do this an awful lot. I speak to stage magicians who don't really do close-up, and you tend to find that a lot of stage magicians do this anyway. They, they do risk assessments on their act. They think through where things can go wrong, possibly because there's so much more that can go wrong with an act 
on stage than close up. So I think a lot of stage magicians do this anyway, but close up magicians don't. They learn the slights, they learn the routines, they learn the tricks, they learn the moves, they put it all together. They might even do set lists, but they don't then take it to the next level and figure out what they're gonna do if this stuff goes wrong. And this that I'm describing to you right now, if you do this, if you take the few days that it's gonna take you to go through your entire repertoire and break this down and do it, it will, I promise you, it will make you a better magician. So there you go, guys. Um, that's probably, you know, one of the most important videos that I've put on this channel. Uh, let me know in the comments down below what you think. Is this something that you've done yourself? Or have you done something similar like this with the tricks that you uh, perform? And did it help you? Uh, and does it help you? If you haven't, is this something that you're going to do? Do you think this is good advice or not? I'd love to know in the comments down below. So do me a favor, leave a comment down below. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And if you want to see more videos like this, please do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll be back again tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be Friday tomorrow, so I'm going to have a shorts at two o'clock, a magic live at six o'clock, and a rant at nine o'clock. I'll see you again. My name's Craig from Magic. <laughs>